Good morning, everyone. This is Craig Zalzer from PCDN here with season 10, episode 14. I think that's right. Um, delighted to have everyone here joining us on LinkedIn and on YouTube and wherever you're watching from. Um, just a little bit, we're delighted to have Arthur Woods join us today. He is a serial founder, impact maker, troublemaker for good. And he's going to be talking about the state of diversity, inclusion, and recruitment in tech and social impact. Um, I will summarize his bio. If I read his whole bio, we'd be here for the entire session. Um, he is a social entrepreneur and L LGBTQ activist or plus activist and neurodiversity advocate working at the intersection of equity, inclusion, technology. He is the author of the national best-selling book, Hiring for Diversity. We'll put the link in the chat. He is a global keynote speaker, delivered three TEDx talks, and has contributed to Harvard Business Review, Fast Company, and Forbes. He is a partner at Plenty Search, which is an exec executive search firm for venture-backed startups that are has a strong fo focus on diversity. He previously co-founded Mathiasen, sorry, I'm a little bit sleepy this morning, a venture-backed technology platform, helping employers with everything they need to manage their diversity hiring, analytics, and training. He came from Google, where he had led operations for YouTube's education division and oversaw YouTube for schools. He previously co-founded Imperative, a leading social learning platform out in tech, the largest global LGBTQ plus technology community and social impact 360. He studied at Georgetown University, Pontifical Universidad Católica de Chile, and HBS Online. He is a World Economic Forum Global Shaper, was a GCT Entrepreneur in Residence, a New York Venture Fellow, SAPIO Foundries Fellow, and sits in the advisory boards of Lyft and Second Day. Um, so, Arthur, thank you so much for joining us. For people who have not participated in one of our so, um, Social Change Career podcasts live stream before, just a couple logistical points. Um, we'd love to hear where people are participating from. So please, in the chat, whether it's now or later on, let us know where you're watching from, a few questions, a few, few sentences about your backgrounds, and then we'd love to bring in questions and comments. So throughout the chat, feel free to put in, you know, if you want to dive into something deeper, you have a question, a comment, we'll try to bring those as much as possible into the chat. This is a live stream, so this will be put up immediately on LinkedIn and YouTube, and then this will be converted to one of our 100 plus episodes of the Social Change Career Podcast in a couple of weeks. And the one request we have, if you're taking a few minutes to watch all or part of this, please think about rating the podcast. It helps grow our um, impact and our user base. So you can do that in any major podcasting platform. And also check out PCDN, Mathiasen, um, Plenty Search, Imperative, and everything else. So before we jump in, I'll just welcome a few people here. So great, Helena, to see you from London. Um, she's a psychology student looking to move possibly into HR and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Nice. Um, welcome um, someone who does recruitment in Nottingham. Welcome Pratima from India. Welcome Christina from RippleWorks. We love RippleWorks. So actually, yes, people don't know RippleWorks, yes. that's wonderful. Um, welcome Marlene from Suriname. I think you're the first person we've had from Suriname. Welcome Brent. Um, so from Virginia, and please let us know, again, as we're going through this, where you're watching from. Uh, so Arthur, thank you so much for making time to join us this morning. I'm based in Medellin, Colombia. Where do we find you this morning? Uh, good, good to see you, Craig. I am in New York City. Okay, good, great. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, I mean, you've already done a lot of things at a relatively young age, and I'm sure there's much more to come, but can you talk a little bit about what has been the central focus or foci of your career in terms of where you're trying to advance impact? Yeah, absolutely, Craig. So, you know, I, I think like everyone on this call, I, I have, I come from a core belief that we can use business as a, as an agent for positive change. Um, it, it, starting in college, I think I really saw firsthand um, starting my very first company that business can be used as, as, a, as a way of creating, you know, positive impact for society. I also, I think really early on, um, had the the realization um, that work is broken for most people, and if we think about that for a moment, you know, work is where we spend the majority of our waking lives. Um, for most people, it's not a place where they experience a great deal of purpose. Uh, you know, I think a lot of folks um, are underemployed, not realizing their full potential in their jobs every day. And I, as I thought really about that, that is a problem set. It got me motivated to say, whatever I'm doing, probably in my next chapter, I want to make sure that I'm making work better for everyone. Um, and that, I, so basically throughout my last, you know, I'd say 12 years, I've been working on different um, technologies, communities, 
um, innovations really to make work better. And most, most recently, um, very much focused on making work more diverse and inclusive. Um, thank you so much. Welcome, Moira. Welcome, Deborah. Um, and again, please let us know where you're watching from and feel free to start putting in your questions and comments. Um, welcome, a user that I'm not sure of your name. And welcome, Beverly, from the DC metro area. Um, so, Arthur, so you're saying that work is not working for everyone. And obviously, you know, all societies ideally should be representative. The institutions of society should be representative of the communities that make up those societies, both at all levels. And so mm -hmm. when you think about diversity and inclusion in the US, let's say in the tech sector, the data, you know, once you move up to mid to higher level and especially at the board level and investor level tends to be quite depressing. So what is some mm -hmm. data you have found or that you rely on to show both the challenge of maybe the lack of inclusion and then, you know, maybe some progress in particular sectors, companies or areas? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Craig. So, I mean, if we look at uh, some of the most common data just in the states alone, right, U.S. census data, we have a decent idea of the overall demographics by function across, you know, across the workforce. And in basically every single function, there's a lack of representation compared to the parity of that demographic in, you know, overall, the overall, you know, workforce. And um, gender gender uh, representation is just one example, right? Um, so we we know, and especially as you mentioned earlier, the the more that you go up in seniority, um, we see diversity, um, you know, decrease uh, e even more significantly. So one example is there's only a handful of women that um, are in the CEO role of public publicly traded companies in the United States, um, versus the you know plethora of uh, men that we see in that role, right? So we, we look at basically every single major demographic. Now, I've been very interested in, you know, a, a book that we wrote about two years ago called Hiring for Diversity was largely focused on helping us also look beyond traditional definitions of diversity to, to acknowledge that we have, you know, we have uh, diversity across, uh, you know, uh, sexuality, across um, refugee status, across many different abilities that, you know, speak to, you know, invisible aspects of diversity that we can't typically notice on someone's LinkedIn profile. So A, we need to take a much more holistic view of how we look at diversity. B, we have to be measuring representation in each of these areas to truly understand what the opportunity is. Okay. Um, thank you so much. And um, Catalina, my wife and I, we do small scale angel investing and in full transparency, we invested a little bit in Arthur's second company, Matthias. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, and she was, she was from Columbia originally. We, we met doing our PhDs, but it's funny because you know I, I do think a good amount of diversity and inclusion in, in all areas, but also in terms of localization and in the international development field. So there's still a lot of colonialism and who, who yes. has power and who's authority. But every time we look at a deal, you know, I mean I look at inclusion, but she'll be like, I'm not, you know, she's always looking at who makes up the company in terms mm -hmm. of identity and background, but also who are the advisors. If there's a bunch of white men, she's like, oh no, you know, generally, yeah. even if it's the most interesting company. Um so when you think about diversity and inclusion, both at, across all your efforts, um, there is a moral argument that it's the right thing to do because institutions should reflect society, but there's also the economic argument. So when you're thinking about inclusion, again, broadly speaking, so you know, how do you encourage companies or what are the, what are the, the, the data, the arguments, or the, you know, how do you frame it to, if you go to a company and you're advising them, or if you're helping yeah. someone hire, you know, how much do you use a moral argument that we should be representative versus how much is the economic argument? And what do you find the most, most impactful for trying to get leadership or others to, you know, basically not just do tokenism, but really think about building in diverse pipelines and, and organizations that are also healthy? It's, it's a really great question, Craig. And I have to say, I, I increasingly am trying not to just make the moral argument because I think we all agree it is the right thing to do for society. It's the right thing to do for the world. But I, I think if, if people leave the conversation around diversity and inclusion and, and think, well, I'm just doing this because, you know, it's, 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 it's the right thing to do. It misses the critical component that it's strategically, I, I believe, the best thing to do for business. I mean, if we look at every single statistic that has been gleaned about the business case around diversity and inclusion, we know that um, you're way more likely to drive innovation in a more um, diverse team. You're way more likely to have higher engagement um, among your team uh, when, when you have uh, representation. Um, you're right. There, there's actually, uh, you know, I think there's, there are major cultural benefits, but 
we actually see that um, statistically speaking, businesses outperform uh, others that are that are less diverse, right? So um, I try to really sort of make this a sort of multifaceted argument. And if we just look at the simple nature, you know, of stepping back and saying we have a team that wants to solve a problem, um, do we believe that um, having a variety of voices on that team and psychologically safe conditions would get us to solve that problem more effectively? The answer is yes, right? The, the sort of traditional command and control homogenous way of sort of operating teams is kind of out the door. Now we're looking at, you know, uh, an environment where if we, we can solve much more complex problems with better safety and, and more sort of diversity across the voices that are in the room. And that's, that, that's the kind of strategic argument I try to make. Okay. Um, so a user just told me something's looping. So please let me know if anyone else is having problems listening. It's showing that it's working on my end. So for that user, oh, okay. I would encourage you to just refresh because it is showing that it's working on my end. I'm just checking. Um, so hopefully it's working for everyone else, but please let me know. Yeah. Um, so we'll move on to some more career questions soon, but is there oh. a sector of the economy or a particular industry that you think is doing better on inclusion that others could emulate? I mean, no, no one is perfect, but when you think about, sure. you know, is it, is it coding? Is it education? Or who, who is doing a better job than others? It's a really good question, and it's in pockets. I mean, if we, if we look at, um, okay, so if we look at the overall workforce, um, at the ground level of healthcare, you see really rich diversity, right? Um, now you start to go up in the ranks in healthcare, and administration starts to look quite homogenous. Um, but you, you actually look at um, a number of, you know, blue collar companies um, that have really rich diversity across their distribution centers, across their, you know, across their, um, their, their, your more, I would say, you know, uh, field, uh, field workforce. Um, but, you know, honestly, Craig, there is a problem of, of a lack of representation across the administrations of most, uh, most sectors. Um, and again, it goes back to what we were, we were talking about earlier. So I really do believe there are bright spots. Um, you know, one of the greatest ways that we can address the diversity problem downstream is by addressing, um, you know, access to education. I think it's something I know you you speak a lot about. Um, but we think about kind of the trickle down impact of there not being adequate, ex accessible, equitable access to education, and it does directly ch change the trajectory of communities um, when they enter the workforce. So I think that, to me, if we if we really follow a theory of change, I'm very excited about the early education work that's happening. Um, there's massive displacement that's going to happen of, of our workforce um, with the advent and introduction of AI. Um, I think a lot about the customer service segments of our workforce that will be largely automated out of the job. So any kind of workforce development work that, that's happening right now, reskilling, uh, retooling our, our existing workforce to help create more mobility um, is going to be, I think, a major pathway to um, greater representation because while these major changes are happening in our workforce, we actually have a chance to make fairly significant shifts in rep rep representation. So to me, we, we can look at some of these trends and, and sort of be a bit scared. I think, I think they present a major opportunity for us to make progress in this area. Thank you. Um, so welcome, Sharbo from Lebanon. Great to see you again. Um, so I will ask a career question, and I see questions are starting to come in, so I want to sure. include them. So can you, we have a couple of people on the call who are already working or on the podcast stream who are already working in recruitment. But for people who are thinking about a career in recruitment or talent management or HR, can you talk a little bit about your career journey, both as an employee and also someone who hires? and what are the most valuable skills that you've developed and mm. what are you encouraging others to, you know, whether they're mid-career or exploring starting off, what are some skills or knowledge areas that we encourage them to develop to stay competitive as, as the world of work is changing quite competitively? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, so first of all, I'll, I have to say I'm biased. I, I believe that um, the HR talent recruiting functions are really the most exciting and the most strategic for organizations. Um, I think probably a lot of folks on, on the call here today buy into that philosophy that um, it really is a competitive advantage when an organization unlocks its talent strategy. And for leaders that truly grasp that and, and lead with it, I think it's, it's an extraordinary um, capability. Um, so this, this work, I've basically uh, sold into heads of HR, uh, heads of talent acquisition for many, many years. 
Um, I've always been more of a strategic uh, sort of external partner. Um, now I'm a, a partner at Plenty Search. We're a, a boutique executive search firm. Um, we're run by all X operators. So kind of similar, similar trajectory. Um, what I would say right now is the what I recommend for talent, for anyone that's, that's pursuing a career in talent, um, is to really sort of double down on the tie into the strategic business, um, business side of, of, of your work. Um, a lot of talent leaders uh, don't make the connection to uh, business drivers, business performance. And so what happens is talent kind of sits in its own little island sort of disconnected from the business and it's not sort of seen as an agent or a, a driver of, of real like business results. So I would say, you know, spend time like developing business acumen. So you have that vernacular, you can speak to leaders in a business, uh, basically it, you know, with, with, with vocabulary of business, you, you understand how talent is a driver for business uh, results. Um, I would also say um, really lean into um, some of these new tools, uh, ChatGPT just being one of them. Um, these aren't going away. They're either going to augment or replace certain talent functions. So I think it's better that we we gain a, a great kind of deal of competence in terms of how how we understand how these tools work, how they fit in with our work. Um, we can either kind of push them away or we can ignore them. I, I would say lean in and, and leverage them, see how they make your work more strategic um, and free up your time. So we have like our recruiters testing out areas of w ways of using ChatGPT. Um, to basically accelerate a lot of uh, the critical functions. Um, the last piece I would just generally say is um, this piece around uh, talent mapping, talent mobility, um, sort of thinking about future org design. These are, these are really strategic pieces of the talent equation right now that I think a lot of folks aren't spending a lot of time uh, thinking about. So I think if you are someone who can, can come into an organization and help it think through what is our future? Because you know, with, with all of these major changes that we're, we're witnessing, um, how does it shift the way we think about the design of our organization, the design of our teams, our roles, the mobility of our talent? Um, if, you, if you're coming in with those types of ideas, I think you're, you're bringing a very kind of strategic um, and competitive uh, advantage to, to the equation. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so Helena, based in the UK, she's been told by a previous employer that a salary gap is inevitable due to the tendency for men to possess more experience than women in the industry. Or at least, wow. let's say, if if not everyone has kids, but if someone does have kids, there's often a penalty if they're out of the workforce mm -hmm. for some period of time um, that I was working in at the time. How would you address this? So I guess the question is, one, specific to Helena, but two is, you know, the pay gap, I think in the U.S. it's 81 cents in the dollar, you know, you know, some countries it's 50, some countries, but like both specific to Helena in general, any thoughts on the structural side? And also if you're an individual employee trying to increase your salary and minimize the pay gap, what do you recommend? Yeah, Helena, great, great question. And I have to say it, 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 it saddens me to read this, but it's, it's you know, we, we certainly wrote about uh, pay and equity in our book. And, and it's, um, it, was, it was one of the most eye-opening uh, parts of the research that we did, you know, to see how, how you know, pay and equity is perpetuated uh, by, you know, everything from inequitable job offers to the lack of pay transparency. Um, and, and what I would say here is this is this idea of industry experience is a bit of a scapegoat in, um, in I think, perpetuating pay and equity. So we try to push back on employers that say, I need, you know, 10 to 15 years of specific industry experience by, by saying, look, what are the, the, the real skills and competencies that this person needs in the role? Um, it doesn't come from an arbitrary number of years of experience. Someone might have gleaned those skills and competencies through a, like, you know, experience in a different industry. Um, so A, we're trying to generally just push back on arbitrary numbers because you're right, there, there might be, if we looked historically at an industry that was quite homogenous and has made maybe some progress toward diversity, if we, if we do require these exorbitant years, then we're not going to change anything, right? Let's instead focus on the skills and experience and competencies that this person needs and be open to, um, I would say, unconventional ways that they've acquired those skills. So increasingly, we're telling employers, remove the year, years of experience altogether, um, remove the ranges altogether as well, because, you know, um, uh, underrepresented job seekers that come in at the bottom end of a range oftentimes will disqualify themselves before they even apply to a job, right? Um, so 
um, by focusing instead on these the sort of competencies, I think it gets us away from this this issue of uh, of kind of inequ inequitable experience. And then just a follow-up question related to Helena's question. Any thoughts on, and we, we did a workshop and Spencer Campbell was on the podcast that'll be out soon, you know, and he's got many years in impact recruiting. He did a workshop at the Career Campus on salary negotiations. And we, we do a lot of work on that. So for individuals, you know, obviously it varies by sector, but any thoughts, whether they're entry or mid-level, two or three tips you would suggest for trying to negotiate a better salary if, if it's not a fixed salary that's listed? Yeah. So a couple a couple things there. One is really don't anchor to your existing pay um, because you're you you may be under market with your existing pay, and if you disclose that, which by the way it's illegal in in many places for folks to ask you your your existing pay or your pay history. Um, so try to refrain from anchoring to that too much. Um, thanks, Elena. Yeah, um, I would say second is come in um, prepared to negotiate because um, it is it has been shown that. Uh, white cisgender men are more likely to negotiate than un other underrepresented communities. And so, um, and, and look, we actually see that that's part of what perpetuates the pay inequity is that when you negotiate, you are more likely to get, um, you know, sort of what, at least a portion of what you ask for, right? So come in ready to negotiate. I know, I know in many cases, I've, I've interviewed folks that have said, I, I grew up culturally taught not to negotiate, not to ask for anything more than what, what, what was sort of presented. So just know that, like, come in with that sort of mindset of ready to negotiate. And then I would say, generally speaking, try to be consistent, right? Um, a lot of employers today are developing fairly uh, rigid uh, policies on negotiation. And so in, any inconsistency in what you communicate as your needs and your goals will, I think, only just sort of fall right into their rigid policies. So um, those are just a few things. I think on the employer front, I recommend having, again, very, very, very consistent um, um, uh, salary ranges for every role, um, making sure that um, folks really understand the parameters of what is within uh, basically the zone of negotiation, if at all, and, um, and try to just be consistent in terms of how you respond to requests because again there's the inconsistency is what creates a lot of the inequities yeah it, it is such a mess still and i'll just share two very quick stories then we'll move on to the question from deborah so i was hiring helping hire once for a position and we'll go into any specifics a person was qualified and i think in our budget we had between like 57 and 63 thousand the range this was our top candidate we offered the salary they didn't negotiate so the nice part of me was like, I wanted them to negotiate because they were qualified and they could have gotten a couple of thousand more. The bureaucratic, the budget side of me was like, great, I've got a few thousand extra to spend somewhere else. So, you know, it, it is very bizarre. And then I've had successful negotiations at others where it doesn't work, um, obviously, but it's, I think your advice is wonderful. And obviously for some sectors, government jobs, you know, multilaterals is generally not possible, but it, if you don't arm yourself with the data and do your research, you're, these, I mean, it's all, it's a structural issue, but you can do some things as an individual. So, um, yeah, so Deb, absolutely. Deborah, so Deborah has the next question. Deborah, if a leader is trying to update their skills, are there any courses you recommend or organizations to belong to? And then, you know, feel free to also talk about Math Mathiasin or Imperative yeah. or Plenty Search and, you know, other places. Yeah, Deborah, this is an awesome question. I'm so glad you asked. So, I, I think in general, anything that um, I just recently took a class um, on data data science, and I I realized that it was you know it, basically data as we all know is pervasive in everything that we do. It is I, I would say that generally speaking, I would imagine in 10, 20 years, every single leader has to be basically well versed in data, has to be well versed in AI, um, has to be extremely essentially um, high EQ. <laughs> Uh, has to have really great executive presence and be will be able to engage um, and, 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 and sort of manage very distributed teams that have never met before. So I think anything that we can do in these zones of being better versed in data, being better versed in AI and the surrounding tools and um, having, I think, really great management and leadership development um, specifically around engaging a distributed workforce. Um, I think those are all competencies that I think are, are not going away as a need. Um, and the last one is really an interesting one because I actually find that it's it's probably the hardest one to um, to, to to sort of gain in a in sort of a in, I would say like a, a an async you know sort of solo uh, development track. It's 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 less 
rote and technical. It's much more sort of interpersonal. But I'm finding that so many leaders I work with, um, you know, they're going to be able to get the technical answers to their questions around things like, you know, how do I, how do I become more of a data-driven leader? I think the interpersonal kind of, you know, uh, management side and leadership development side of things is where folks need the most community. And so that's actually really what I love what, what you do, Craig, is you're, you know, you're building, you're building community around leaders that are growing. And um, we need, you know, we need, we need a lot of this development to be done in a social setting and not just, uh, you know, sort of individual. Um, so, and, and then thank you so much. And then following up on that, is there any- Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> um, so Deborah's saying her son majored in data science and Mandarin, but following up on this, Arthur, is there, I mean, obviously LinkedIn Learning has a lot of good courses. Some are free if you don't have a yeah. paid subscription, but other ones, I mean, and they have, I think for about another three weeks, they have about a hundred AI courses that are free. So I've been watching a lot of them just trying to, I mean, I read a lot, but I'm just trying to understand and upskill as much as possible. But, you know, other communities like out in tech or like, where do you go? I mean, obviously you have your, you have your peer networks, but where do you go professionally mm -hmm. where you find inspiration or you can go to a colleague like, I struggle with this and, you know, conferences, networks, newsletters, where do you go? Yeah. So a, a few things, depending on the, 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 the you know, the um, discipline that you're in. I, uh, I'm a huge fan of Coursera, of Udemy. Um, my old, uh, my old employer, YouTube, we have um, hundreds of thousands of uh, free online courses. You can actually go and audit um, a lot of college courses online. We've, you know, basically throughout the, the last, 10 years, YouTube ended up partnering with many colleges to basically just like they, they have fully upload their courses. So you can essentially like, you know, shadow these courses. So name any topic uh, that's of interest and there's a course on YouTube um, to find it um, and to, to, to sort of drill, drill in more. Um, LinkedIn learning is wonderful. Yeah. I mean, to your point, Craig, there's, there's really good premium curated content there. Um, I, you know, a lot of it is behind a pay gate, but they've made a lot of it, um, you know, no cost. Um, I, you know, just in terms of conferences, I'm a huge, if people are into the talent and um, HR community, I'm a huge fan of Transform. It used to be called HR Transform. It's now just Transform. Um, that's, that's always a, 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 an amazing one. Um, um, ASU GSV is, is a big education conference that happens every year. Um, that's where a lot of my, my former education colleagues go. Um, and, you know, in general, I would say that we're, we're seeing new content pop up in some of the most unconventional places, including um, even just folks that are still doing their clubhouse talks. You know, Craig, I don't know if you've if you, if you done, uh, have you been on clubhouse recently? No, I never got into clubhouse. I, don't, I never got on the bandwagon, but I know it's good. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've done a couple of them. It's great. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, of course, took off during the pandemic. Um, you know, I'm also finding that um, increasingly folks are using, I, I, I have a, a colleague who works at TikTok and, um, you know, increasingly folks are even using short form uh, platforms like TikTok to provide educational content. And it's very, you know, bite-sized, accessible. I never would have thought to, uh, TikTok is a place where you can learn something, but, you know, it's amazing that you can see um, even, even a platform like that has um, the ability to, to, you know, provide some learning pathways. Yeah, we, we have some, a developer and, a, and his wife who work with us, and she's brilliant in marketing. He's brilliant in UX design, and they're pushing us to get on TikTok. They're like, and, and I've been resistant, but I think I'm going to do it because we're like, that's where the next generation is, both both for learning yeah. and sharing. Um, so a couple more questions have come in, but I want to ask a general question. So Plenty Search, you're an executive talent recruitment. So two things. One, can you describe a little bit how people could engage with Plenty Search? But two is, yeah. could you just talk about I don't know if you want to call yourselves talent recruiters, headhunters, I mean, agent, but a little bit about demystifying how people, whether it's with Plenty Search or others, like how if someone is junior, mid career, senior, and they are not yeah. familiar with how to engage with companies like Plenty Search, like what are your recommendations? It's a really great question. So, so to give you a sense of the just quick talent landscape uh, around executive search, so um, there are a couple different types of, um, of, search firms out there. Um, we're what, what's called a retained executive search firm. Um, and that means that companies usually come to us with uh, a VP or C-suite role that they're trying to hire for. They pay a retained fee um, and they, they have a dedicated team from us that basically manages that search for them. Um, and so we also have what's called contingent firms. And these folks typically work as more of a success-based 
uh, uh, model. And um, they're, they're typically doing more junior kind of mid-level searches. Um, sometimes there are, there are contingent searches that are done for executive search. Um, so for us, we're, um, you know, a boutique firm. We're about 17 people um, run by all X operators. And we usually help high growth startups build their leadership teams. So what I recommend if you're, first, first of all, if you're someone who's excited about, you know, joining maybe the leadership team of a high growth startup, you might've come from the corporate world or you might've done startup work today and you, you, you're, you know, you're interested in a, you know, a, 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 you know, an opportunity at a, a growing maybe venture backed startup. Um, each one of the um, search firms like Plenty, like us, um, has the ability to, you know, write in uh, on, on the, the, the company's public site to say, I'm a candidate, I'm looking for this opportunity, you know, here's my resume. So that's always an option. And um, companies like us, you know, as, as do we, like build a talent pool um, to, to, you know, opportunistically help connect candidates to opportunities. We typically start with the employer and we, you know, take on a search, we map the, um, the market, and then we do an exhaustive search inclusive of our network. So having, um, you know, your resume in our database is always helpful, right? We know that you're looking and we can, we can look, look, look there first. Um, I generally recommend, uh, you know, uh, you know, Googling um, search firms that might be in the domain where you're working. Um, there are, we're a generalist search firm. So we, we cover, you know, basically every function. Um, there are some search firms that are more, um, you know, functionally specific um, and or, or some search firms that are actually more sector specific. So, um, you know, there, there's, you know, not not a not a, uh, you know, an, an exhaustive number. You, you can start to kind of Google and find the ones that you you um, you, you know, you're interested in. Um, and I would say for the most part, if you reach out to these firms, um, at the very least, they get back to you and say, thanks, you know, we'll we'll, we'll share your profile with our team. Um, and that can't hurt if, if that's if that's a way that you'd like to find a job. So just one more follow-up question on that, and then we'll get to the questions from Salome and Josh. Um, so can you just talk about well, two, two things? Actually, one just about plenty search. So in terms of your market, is it only US startups? So just if someone happens to listen or watch this in the future, so mm-hmm. your generalist firm that t- tends to work more at VP and C suite, not exclusively, but is it tech and US only, just if someone is looking at talent? Yeah, great question, Craig. So we're across sectors, uh, inclusive of tech, but we've also done work in the nonprofit sector and many others. Um, We're mainly US based, we've also done international searches. So I'd say the majority of our searches are in the States, but uh, we, you know, have have worked with multinational companies that have, might might have a presence um, outside of the US and are coming to the US or vice versa. Okay. And then just one other question for candidates. Can you almost break down, let's say, a typical, not so specialized that you know, there's only like a few people in the world who are qualified, but a role that yeah. could be competitive? You know, you help the employer draft the job description, you start recruiting, but just a little bit about like the metrics. So, mm-hmm. you know, obviously it's different if you're just doing, let's say, out inbound research or like you're just looking for a specific pool versus you do open applications. But you know, how many applications do you get? And then as the as the search firm or the talent assistant, you know, are you, are you picking out of 300, you're picking 20 to interview and then you pass to the, just a little bit of the metric, you pass the employer like the sure. top 10 and they do the final reviews or how does that process work? Yeah, I can walk through that actually. So um, a typical search, let's say it, we, we're, we're managing a chief technology officer search. We would typically uh, research and engage six or 700 profiles. Um, We'd end up interviewing, uh, you know, potentially as many as a hundred folks, um, you know, more more consistently maybe like sixty, and um, the the client would end up speaking to uh, anywhere from ten to twenty of those folks to get to a final slate of three or four that they're really interested in moving forward with, and they make an offer to one, and there are typically a couple candidates that are backup. The average time to fill a role is about one hundred twenty days in the industry. Um, for us, our average time to fill is seventy days. Okay, wonderful. Thanks. Um, So I'll bring in the next question from Salome. Um, So the tech industry and the tech recruitment industry have been historically very male dominated. What tips, ideas, suggestions do you have to help attract more diverse candidates into the industry? Um, You know, there's also been there's also been a lot of exposés once certain people from diverse backgrounds get into the industry. Not not everybody, but, you know, even though there is effort, there's still a lot of unhealthy work cultures or discrimination or structural challenges. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And it gets to your earlier point, Craig, which is that we can't just you know, assume that diversity alone will solve all of our problems. We need to make sure that we're building inclusive um, places where people have a sense of belonging and that have equitable systems. So, um, so I, I think there, th this, th this is a little bit multifaceted. So uh, one piece is that we have, to, we have to be open to recruiting outside of the industry if we want to change the, the, the diversity of the industry, right? Um, so that, that's one piece. And that gets back to the point about focusing more on skills and experience and less on specific industry you know, industry years, right? Um, the second is that we have, we have the ability to really look within our own organizations when we're hiring for a role. Um, there, there's oftentimes um, great diversity that exists in more junior uh, employees. And we can look at sort of bringing folks up instead of constantly looking externally. So a classic thing is like, I will go, I'm hiring for a role. I'm gonna go find, you know, sort of our nearest competitor and, and recruit someone directly from that organization. It might be a, a homogenous hire. So we need to look not only out externally, but also internally as we're trying to you know, grow, grow our teams. Um, finally, I think there's a real opportunity for us to think about how we reduce bias across our hiring process. So um, one of the major re like, reasons that I decided to do this book two years ago is we looked at you know, folks that had a lot of great goals around increasing diversity of their teams. And they were just looking at sourcing and they weren't looking at changing anything else. And you then open up the, you know, sort of the, the process and you, you notice, wow, there, there are completely unstructured interviews. There isn't a consistent way that jobs are scoped. Um, there's an, ex an exorbitant amount of bias that's showing up in the decision-making process. So we, we have to really look not only at our sourcing, but also at every step of our process to look at how we basically reduce bias. And a lot of that does come down to process design, but it also comes down to training of our teams and particularly our hiring managers. So when I, when I speak to, to companies that really have this as a goal, I, I say that sourcing is only a third of the equation. We also need to look at our systems and we need to look at the behavior of our people as the other two major components of the process. Um, so thank you so much, Salome. So two follow-up questions and we'll get to Josh's and I think Priya has one from India. Um, so I, I have members of my family from LGBTQ background, you know, and um, the U.S. currently is in some states, you know, the NACCP just released a travel advisory against Florida. And I'm a mm. Florida resident, even though I live overseas, mm -hmm. Florida is my residency. So um, there's a lot of backlash in the U.S. Mm. in certain states and political movements, not to get into Democrat versus Republican or independent, but, you know, there's a lot of backlash around diversity, inclusion, you know, language and policies. So do you see companies or nonprofits reluctant to really talk more about diversity publicly in certain states or that because of this, these kind of challenge around narrative and laws and policies that more companies are, are saying like, this is our stand regardless. I mean, or it's, it's just hard yeah. to generalize. It, it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, look, we look at, um, and, and I, I, as a Florida resident as well, we look at what's happening with Disney in, in Florida. And um, here you have a company that's taken, a, 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 I think, a, a, a great public stance in support of um, underrepresented communities. And, um, you know, I think you have a lot of other companies that are afraid of, uh, you know, of, of being in, impacted legally um, that are going to definitely, uh, you know, I think, take their foot off the gas of this work um, because they are afraid of, you know, facing headwinds in their local state. So I, I, I think it, sadly it's going to create a bit of a, um, a, a you know, I would say a, a delineation there. You're going to have some where this, this actually supercharges them to do right by their people. Others where that it's actually causes them to, to sort of disengage. And, and I, I'm really worried about that second piece. Um, so I, I think a, you know, what I tell employers and Craig, you and I've had this conversation before as well. I think this is a moment where you as an employer can, are, are potentially enacting the most progressive policies that your team member, that your employees will experience, because we can't assume that the state that, that are, you know, any kind of public government is, is going to be leading with the most progressive policies. Now we as employers have more agency over progressive uh, policy systems and benefits um, more than the, the, you know, states where we're operating. And I, that's very sad, but I think it's, to me, it's a, it's a call to action for employers. Right. Um, and I think I get a great example of that, not to get political, but, you know, when we look at some of the, 
um, recent, you know, Supreme Court shifts that had impacted um, women, right? Um, many employers said, we will not let this stop us. We will provide travel reimbursement if you are someone who needs to get an abortion, right? Um, you know, wherever you fall politically, um, that, that, is a, that, that is a benefit to, to employees is um, very empowering for many folks, right? Um, so there is a, there's an element of choice that employers have right now, even, even in spite of what's happening in the public sector. And I think employers need to pay a lot of attention to that. And for people who want to look at companies or nonprofits that are thinking about diversity, inclusion, equity, health, um, you know, there's a human rights campaign does rankings, Just Capital, but any other places that you'd recommend people might go to, to, to yeah, find good ratings? Know, it's it's a really good question. I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of yes, I'm a huge fan of Just Capital. If you if you were to look at, um, there are a lot of amazing indices, by the way, now that are that are popping up around also you know companies that are making investments in sustainability. Um, I would say that Glassdoor actually still does a pretty good job of of helping describe um, the culture, the benefits. Um, you know, they're getting way 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 more granular in terms of the um, the, the types of things you can learn about an organization. Um, I still have not seen anyone that I think has really kind of cracked the code on the DEI metrics um, from a public, I would say like a public employer branding perspective or, you know, talent, talent uh, kind of insights perspective. Um, Glassdoor, I think is, is, is probably the furthest along, um, you know, best places to work. I always find is a little bit watered down. Um, it's, it's very much pay, pay to play now. Um, so a lot of employers can kind of game the system with best places to work. It doesn't seem to give, um, I think very kind of granular insights on the employer as much as I think you see in others. Um, but I actually really put the onus on the job seeker to ask these questions in the interview process. Remember you're interviewing your employer just as much as they're interviewing you. So when you ask questions like what are your holistic benefits for team members? Um, what, are the, what are the investments you've made in DEI? Um, is there dedicated capacity on the team to help manage and, and support these efforts? Um, you know, even just simple things like, do you pay, do you have employee resource groups and do you pay your ERG leaders? These are really good questions to ask. And it gives you a bit of a litmus test in terms of the authentic investment that employers are making. Thank you so much. Just one quick comment, then I'll get to Josh's question. Um, you know, you and I also started conversing around um, invest, sustainable investing, put in a plug for Carbon Collective. And one of the things that I find most companies that are working on issues or nonprofits where there's some connection to social justice, also are not looking at where they invest their employees' retirements. So that's a whole other area. I mean, usually you can't get that information until you have a job offer. So it, you, know, you can get some, you can find stuff publicly if you go to the Department of Labor and look up the 5,500 forms in the US. Mm. Um, but it's also, you know, if you're working for a nonprofit that's all about climate justice and their money is invest or banked in a place that's destroying the planet. So that's another area. It's hard to do it outside unless you're working for an advocacy organization. But once you're inside, um, particularly organizations or companies that are publicly declaring. And when I look at ESG or social responsible investing, 98% of what I see labeled ESG is just crap. So I'm just saying that yeah. that's another area that's not looked at, but let's get to Josh's question. Um, so one of the challenges that he has in Netherlands is being able to track diversity data due to GPTR. Um, mm. um, so you ever come across this hurdle before any recommendations, you know, whether it's in the US or privacy, how do you deal with, you know, privacy and government or, you know, this level, it's the EU regulations around data that can be collected. Yeah, Josh, this is a really great question. And um, any company that is aspiring to be GDPR compliant and, and do business in EMEA has to basically uh, face this, this, this question. Um, my, my recommendation, I think where we have uh, you know, a good kind of Venn diagram um, in, in, in a strategy here is, I, first of all, I, I believe that every company that possibly can anonymously and voluntarily collect diversity data um, should do so to the best of their abilities. Um, I believe where it becomes more of a possibility in EMEA is if it is indeed anonymous and it's only, this data is only collected um, it, you know, basically in a voluntary anonymous capacity and it's only presented in the aggregate. The, the spirit behind the GDPR, you know, uh, basically legislation is, is basically that, you know, we don't want a situation where an individual employee is, ha has anything that's disclosed about their own personal identity that they did not agree to disclose and that they, they did not, they were not certain how that data was being used. 
if the data can be collected in a way that um, every employee is empowered to, to not self-identify or not share data if they don't want to, and their individual data is never tied to their identity, it's only uh, a data point in, an, in a larger aggregate set that's statistically valid. And um, we never could know, for example, on a team of five, we picked out the one person, right? So it has to always be at a, a, certificate, uh, a, a statistical um, uh, significance so that you can't identify an individual person, that's where this actually starts to be much more possible. Now, in EMEA, I think a lot of companies have um, gone the route of not collecting anything altogether because they're just, I think there is, there is a bit of a fear of, um, you know, get, getting, you know, in trouble. Um, but I think that where we, again, where we can start to create much more of a pathway here is typically, I, I think what's happening in EMEA today is there, there's gender data that can be um, captured. And that's basically it. In the United States, we have a much uh, more extensive taxonomy. But again, very important that it's only collected uh, anonymously and it's only presented in the aggregate. Um, so Pratim has a great question. We were just talking about this. I, um, I was doing scholarship reviews for the RISE Fellowship yesterday. You know, we, And this is one of the things that came up. One of the young candidates talked about Talent is universally distributed. Opportunity isn't, um, you know. And so, yeah, team is saying, nice. are there remote positions for people in India? Can they apply for U.S. social impact companies? So, I, I would broaden that out to say, people based. I don't like the term global south, but let's say outside of the U.S., North America, and Europe, who want to work in the impact space. What are your tips? Are there increasing number of remote jobs, or where do people go, or? You know, when might an organization, whether it's based in Europe or the U.S. or Canada, potentially be open to sponsoring visas? Yeah, it's a great question. And look, I, I've seen, you know, especially during the pandemic, and Craig, you could probably speak to this you know, better than I could as well. I, I think that we've seen a major shift toward, um, you know, a, a more global workforce, a more global distribution of teams, uh, largely fueled by the pandemic. I think we... We learned during the pandemic, wow, like, okay, all of a sudden, we don't all have to be sitting exactly next to each other to get work done. Um, and if we're now open to people working from anywhere, what, why not also include international teams? As long as time zones work and we can, we can figure out a way to kind of work async or have, you know, some healthy overlap. So I do see a lot of even early stage companies looking at some of their functions um, in a much more international way. Um, and even with plenty, we have, we have some you know, team members that are, that are, um, international and, um, we all operate in a very, you know, similar time frame in terms of our, our work day. And we use Slack and we use, you know, Google documents and all of these great, you know, tools to do asynchronous work. Um, so I, I think, you know, just to quick, Pratima, Pratima, just a quick answer to your question. I think, yes, there's, I think we're only going to see a more kind of global, uh, you know, global, uh, distribution of teams. Um, you know, there are some, uh, you know, sites like remotejobs.com. Um, I still see a lot of employees um, on, on, you know, uh, remote teams getting hired through Upwork and Fiverr, you know, two large freelance platforms. Um, you know, there, I, I think in general, um, LinkedIn continues to be the place where we do most of our recruiting. So I'd say like keeping, if you're, especially someone who's in that more mid to senior level, um, I would say having a really uh, well uh, put together LinkedIn profile. Um, that accounts for all of the, um, you know, experiences you've really had. That goes a really long way. Um, and in general, I think, uh, you know, emphasizing how you've successfully managed remote work um, and how you've been able to engage remote teams successfully really sort of sets you apart. So it tells us as the potential employers here, um, you, you know, we, we don't have any, you know, qualms about having, having someone who's um, abroad, if, if we know that they can work, they've successfully had a track record of working with remote teams. Thanks. Um, I'll make two comments. So the first is we post a lot of remote opportunities on PCDN, especially in our career campus. I'd say about 10 to 15%. Remote doesn't always mean global. Sometimes it might be remote US, remote Latin America, you know, remote in a particular region. Uh, I have not seen any data on this, but I see an increasing number, particularly I'd say nonprofits and foundations, where they're saying we have a preference for candidates from the global south. Um, so we've had a lot mm -hmm. of our clients. I mean, the dream is not the dream is, I mean, I've, I've moved lots of times, but the dream is you shouldn't have to move for work if you don't want to, or you know, it's also very expensive and bureaucratic. So if you can land a remote job in your home region, you know, where you're getting, let's say, a salary either global north or mid-range. So I have a bunch of friends who've been able to do that. Um, mm -hmm. There is no site, 
tech world is very open. Your social impact, there's some things I'd say PCDN's one, you know, LinkedIn, and then make a plug for RippleWorks. So yeah, they have, RippleWorks does now hire mostly remote. They only have, I think they are interviewing for one position now. I don't think they're taking applications, but they launched a job board about two months ago. Um, and so one of the places to look at like RippleWorks, Unreasonable, Luminate, the venture funders of social impact organizations, quite a, and you can find on PCN in a meta job list, quite a few of them have set up job boards of not just their openings at the specific organization, but their network. And that is a really good place. I find that's one of the best places, Ripple Work and Reasonable, Illuminate, some of the startup accelerators, but you know the impact investors try to find those. And there's also good Slack groups, a couple of good Facebook groups, but, but and then there is ChatGPT just launched a plugin called Ambition or someone built it to be in ChatGPT, which is for job searching. I did a video on it last week. It's decent. It's still early stage. So like you could play around with the parameters, rem find me remote jobs and X and, you know, but it's it's still too early to be really good. Um, so Fl Florence, great to see you. She's just making a plug for Michelle Hayward, who does great work in recruitment and engineering. So thank you. And please check out Florence's work. Um, Angela is just saying, um, does a lot of work on inclusion and international development. Um, you know, has a lot of experience of just saying progress is being made. It's obviously a very difficult time for backlash. Um, a lot of people. So Florence is saying at Kichocho, and they completely agree with you about kind of working and much deeper than just sourcing. Um, you know, kind of a band-aid approach. Um, yeah. Christine, Christina from Ripple Works again. Please check out Ripple Works. I'm just seeing a couple of their Ripple Works is amazing, by the way. I, I yeah, just started and we're, we're not getting works and we're not getting paid yeah. to say this. We just love them. Oh. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> we're not. We're not. We're not. Uh, paid in purpose. Paid in purpose. Yes. I like that. Maybe that should be your next book. Paid in purpose. Um, That's right. That's right. So Pratima is saying thank you. So I'm going to ask two more questions. If anybody else wants to put in one more, I could probably squeeze it in. So one is the. Kathleen and I, my wife and business partner, we were talking about um, just the changing nature of work. And one of the scary trends is really the gigification of everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and obviously, like we live in Colombia, we have Rappi, which is like on demand delivery of anything, anytime. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, it's wonderful for the users, the drivers, it's not that wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. But as everything becomes gigified, um, what are your thoughts about? Is it going to be a small group of people who have stable jobs? I mean, civil service you know, will stay somewhat stable, but is it going to be mostly a small group of people who have jobs with benefits? Uh, let's say another group who have enough skills and ability to sell themselves that they're going to be continually employed, but is the rest just mm -hmm. going to be people suffering whether, I mean, if you're doing agriculture, maybe not, or, you know, certain jobs that require human labor, but like, what is the future of work in general? And, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm increasingly convinced that like, you know, if we don't have universal basic income everywhere, yeah. some social, you know, with, with benefits, like it's going to be a pretty dire future in terms of the, yeah. the, the collection of capital and just the control of, you know, labor. So what are your thoughts just like the future of work in the impact sector, tech sector, and, and, mm. and just to put in the context, a lot of people don't know, and rest rest of the world, rest of the world, um, Sophie Schmidt has been doing, you know, it's a great um, reporting outlet that's doing a lot in the tech sector and other regions. So they've been doing a lot of reporting and others, just that so much of the labor to build chat GPT and the machine learning models is done by people or Facebook moderators. A lot of it's done by people in global south who are working under very difficult conditions so any yes. thoughts on that yes well craig i mean I, I would just plus one to everything you just asked uh, i mean what what keeps me up at night is uh well i guess i'll step back and say i do i do believe that we are going we're moving to more of a gigification portfolio of work um model where everyone essentially ultimately becomes a bit of a company of one and it it, it would be totally logical to see a situation where I'm a 1099, you know, employee or consultant across many different, you know, uh, individual clients. And I, I don't really have a full-time job as we would design it today. Um, that could absolutely be the case. I think that um, what, what I get really concerned about is the idea as just as you described that there's sort of a utopia dystopia that's created of work and you have the knowledge worker, the highly specialized knowledge worker, um, who does have maybe this extremely lucrative portfolio of work um, 
and might actually be afforded a full-time opportunity somewhere. But basically, most of their work is augmented by things like AI. Um, and so the work week for this person is potentially much smaller. Um, they're paid a lot more per hour for the work that they do, and they have a lot of sort of idle time. And you then look at the sort of dystopia side of it, and that is that there is, it is still cheaper to pay an individual human to do manual work than it is to replace them with technology. Um, and it becomes almost like the modern day sweatshop. Um, and that, that I think to your point could, could come with some major, major societal issues. Um, in particular, if we haven't set parameters around minimum, you know, minimum pay, um, and working conditions, you know? So, um, I, I really think, you know, sadly history could repeat itself. And we, we look back to the, you know, the industrial age and, and I think we could actually see some, some, major repeats there. So I think what it, what it means is that we have to, first of all, make sure that the technology that's created is not simply just given to the select few, right? That, that this, these tools that are getting created are, um, first of all, um, accessible. Um, they're, they're, um, they're, they're basically built to augment every kind of work and not simply just the knowledge worker type of work. Um, and we have to set, I think really this is where we will have to lean on policymakers to set really strong parameters to ensure that folks are paid a living wage and um, are protected. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Florence, for the tag. So last question, we have about two minutes. Um, so you talked about doing a data science course. Um, anything else you're doing could be completely for fun, a TV series, a book, a play, or something you're doing professionally. Like what, what is sparking your creativity or interest these days? So I, I have to, I'll pull up my, my, my book list here. So there are just a couple books I'll tell you that are, that, um, that, that I'm, I'm really interested in right now. So one is um, I'm, I'm reading a book right now um, called New York, the novel, and it's about the history of New York um, uh, that basically it's, 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 it's a historical fiction of New York from the very beginning when it was actually New Amsterdam. Um, and it's just a fascinating, folks are, are interested in um, historical fiction in general. It's great. Uh, it's a great book. Um, I'm reading a book called uh, uh, Power Versus Force, which is uh, much more about kind of mindfulness. And um, I'm very interested generally in air ways that we elevate consciousness in our work every day. I think a lot of actually the things that we just spoke about, Craig, um, speak to um, a challenge of a lack of consciousness in daily work. Um, and I, I, I actually really believe that if we bring greater mindfulness into our work as especially um, leaders, um, it, it enables us to not go down the path of highly marginalizing or, or more greatly marginalizing the workforce. So that's been an interesting okay. topic. So thank you so much for your time, energy, and wisdom. And thank you, everyone, for your great questions and comments from all over. Um, please check out the podcast in general. Check out Plenty Search, um, you know, the resources, RippleWorks. And just one thing to help, I mean, obviously, Amplified Plenty Search, follow Arthur on LinkedIn and other channels. And Please, if you rate the podcast, you know, it just takes two seconds, whatever your platform, it just helps, no cost to it. Um, again, thank you so much, Arthur. This will be live. I mean, it's already going to be on LinkedIn and YouTube, but it'll be live as a podcast in about three or four weeks. So we'll make a plug there. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. And Arthur, have a wonderful morning. Enjoy New York. I hope you get some good bagels. And um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Craig. Have a good one. Thanks, everyone.